If you can see the world the way another person sees it through their head and through their heart, you can navigate yourself gracefully through life. Champions are made and cash always follows. But where did it all start? These are the true stories of the blockbuster sports deals that went down in the locker room, boardroom, and between the lines that made many people very, very wealthy. This is The Playbook. Good to see you, Lee. How are you? <laughs> are we on? We're on. <laughs> That's fine. It's even better for me to use that. Great. Welcome to our office. You know, there's one thing about Lee Steinberg is he always has the best view. And uh, that's incredible. I look over a parking lot. So once again, I aspire to be Lee Steinberg. <laughs> um, I've been blessed because I got to work with you. Mm -hmm. And the day that you hired me was probably one of the most exciting days of my life because I dreamed about being a sports agent. In fact, specifically, I'd, not to embarrass you and make you feel uncomfortable, but I literally dreamed about being Lee Steinberg. And I went to law school, loved sports. Obviously, I don't have the talent to play sports. Uh, but I thought, gosh, to be Lee Steinberg, you know, the number one most powerful person in sports, not only an extraordinary intellect, but a humanitarian. And, you know, I just am here. I, I'd like to start with a really different type of question. What did you want to be when you grew up, since there was no Lee Steinberg to look <laughs> up to? Well, there was no field of agentry, even when I started in 1975. So I wanted to be a great leader of men for great purposes. So if I was going to be a lawyer, it'd be like Clarence Darrow. I'd be defending the downtrodden. Um, I saw a Martin Luther King, a, a Gandhi, not to be grandiose, but the ability to make life better. My dad raised me with two core values. One was treasure relationships, especially family, and the second was try to make a fundamental difference and change in the world in a positive way and help people who couldn't help themselves. So life was going to be focused that way, maybe law, maybe politics. Well, I would say not only did you do that in your career, Lee has done over three billion dollars worth of deals, represented some of the most not only influential players, but more importantly, you know, it must be really fun for you because it is for me to see the guys. You, you have this dream that not only will I represent the Warren Moons, the Steve Youngs, and the Troy Aikmans of the world, eight first picks in a row, which will never be matched, but moreover, you were going to create legacy. So not only did you empower, you know, all these people to be successful and make change, but you taught these other high powered bug lights, as I call them how to empower others as well. So not only do you affect thousands of athletes that you represented, but they affect thousands and even millions because of TV. And you know, for me, it's one of the most exciting things I learned from you is that Dave, it's one thing to represent these guys, but to build a legacy that you can use these guys to you know, stop climate change. You know, and these, these visionary things that you have, people see you as, you know, this Jerry Maguire figure that represented and were around all these cool athletes and on TV and you did all the great movies, Jerry Maguire and a given Sunday for Love the Game. But what I see is the effect that you have when I watch Steve Young, for example, and all the kids that he changed their lives. It's because when he was a young man, you guided him and said, hey, look, you're going to be a great football player. We both know that. And I'll help. And both Steve and Warren went different paths. You helped them, but moreover, you taught them. Warren's Foundation has sent thousands of kids to college. Just one life of sending to a college. So tell me about that legacy side. What inspired you to you know, have the vision and the most competitive, it was sports law when you started. And maybe let's start there. How did you start in sports law? So I went to Berkeley in the wild days of the late 60s. And was it true you actually debated Ron Reagan? Oh, I did. You did. I learned everything I needed to learn about negotiating from dealing with Ronald Reagan. We were on the streets demonstrating against the war in Vietnam. He was cracking down and every time he did his ratings went way up. So I had a lot of interactions. One in front of the Board of Regents um, where it would take too long to explain, but he taught me uh, a whole lot. Um, 
so I was a dorm counselor in an undergraduate dorm and they moved the freshman football team into the dorm. One of the students was named Steve Bartkowski. He was a quarterback. He was picked in 1975 as the very first pick in the NFL draft overall. And he asked me to represent him. So he had no representation when he was drafted, right? This is the old days. This he didn't, yeah. but he but picked you. <laughs> but, but he picked me. And, <laughs> and there, how old were you? There was twenty five. Twenty five years old. There was no field of of agentry. Teams could simply hang up the phone and say we don't deal with agents. So uh, we got out there and we had a World Football League competing against an NFL and we got the largest rookie contract in NFL history. So we get to Atlanta, there are Klieg lights flashing in the sky at the airport like for a movie premiere. A huge crowd's pressed up against the police line and the first thing we hear is we interrupt the Johnny Carson show to bring you a special news bulletin. Steve Bartkowski, Lee Steinberg have just arrived at the Atlanta airport. We switch you live. And it was then, Dave, that I saw the tremendous idol worship and veneration that athletes are held in communities across the country. And I thought, you know, if an athlete would go back to the high school community that helped shape him and set up a scholarship fund or work with the Boys and Girls Club, he would lay down roots and impact that area, always have a home to go home to. At the collegiate level, those alums are an invaluable resource for second career, uh, and they relate to the university through the football or basketball program. So that's where a Troy Aikman endowed a full scholarship at uh, UCLA or Warren Moon at, at Washington or Steve Young at BYU, Edger and James at Miami. And then at the Pro City, we would set up a foundation that had the leading business figures political figures and community leaders and then execute a program so the athlete found something in their own life that was a problem in the world that always bothered them and this was something they could leave legacy on so as you mentioned warren moon set up his crescent moon foundation sent hundreds and hundreds of kids to college on his money i mean warren would be prototypical high school scholarship fund junior college, uh, University of Washington, and the Crescent Moon Foundation moved every time he moved. But it's work done, the running back. Talk uh, about a full circle, right? right? Where you are now, you, you just had the second highest drafted quarterback, Mahomes, mm -hmm. out of nowhere, right? And you know, I'm in this circle, so I love the egos, and you know, I'm, you know, I hate to say it publicly, I'm your biggest fan. So I love when all the egos of all the guys that left you and mm -hmm. have not maybe treated you as righteously as you deserve. But I love the fact that there you were, Mahomes. But there was another quarterback in the draft that actually was one of Warwick Dunn's beneficiaries. Yes, right? it was. So tell us about that. So Warwick set up a program, which I helped him with, called Homes for the Holidays. And it takes single mothers and their families and puts them into the first home they'll ever own. He makes a down payment, he has it outfitted. Deshaun Watson lived in one of those homes. But the whole point is athletes can trigger imitative behavior. They can permeate the perceptual screen that young people put up against all authority figures. Don't want to listen to a teacher, don't want to listen to a uh, high school principal, don't want to listen to the police. But the right athlete can make a difference. So when Lennox Lewis, the heavyweight boxer, cut a public service announcement that said, real men don't hit women, it could do more to address the issue of uh, domestic violence in young people's lives than a thousand authority figures ever could. Or Oscar De La Hoya and Steve Young, prejudice is foul play. So they can have a, an effect, and you mentioned the environment. Warren Moon and Bruce Smith joined the uh, million person uh, virtual environmental uh, march on Washington, and Warren and I cut a PSA for Sierra Club. So you can take any issue, Dave, and the athlete can bring awareness to it, can bring change to it. Um, so really what we do here is enhance young people's lives by stimulating the best in them, focusing them from the beginning towards second career. So three of our 
former players are now minority owners of actual football teams. Wow. And uh, that's the first three group, but they they go on and they do e extremely if, well. And, and they talk about first, first circle, but even if the player doesn't do well on the field, let, let me give you an example and you're gonna know what I'm talking about. Probably your biggest uh, failure client on the field, known as the biggest bust in history on the NFL field, you know, I see now, and I talk to him, and so do you, and I'm sure you're close to him, but I'm so proud of Ryan Leaf, right? R Ryan Leaf, you know, had to mature. He, he made mistakes like both of us have made. He had a disease, right? And, and yet, here you are still, even though he didn't prove himself on the field, and I think you told me at one time that Jeff George and Ryan Leaf may have been the two most talented quarterbacks that you ever represented on uh, physical talents, but neither performed to their aptitude. But now off the field, to me, what Ryan Leaf is doing is as significant as any of the Hall of Fame players, and there's tons of them. Uh, you have two a year going in now. Uh, but as, as many as all of them, Ryan Leaf's making a significant difference with a huge problem that exists in America. And so what you said to him really stuck. So there's an opioid epidemic in this country with pills, and uh, more people are overdosing on opioids than are being killed in auto accidents. Wow. That is a frightening stat. So Ryan Leaf, who had problems w with pills, uh, is out there talking to people, trying to, and he's open and transparent about his own life. And so he can make a difference. It's for the same reason I've been open about my struggle with alcohol. Because for something good to come of it, um, Letting people in the world know that there is help available, that it's not hopeless, is really important. And if we don't do it in this lifetime, what lifetime are we waiting for? Um, and, I, and I actually owe you, you thanks because, you know, for me, where my career took off as a, was when I illuminated the fact that I lost everything, right? That I broke a Lee Steinberg rule. I wasn't kind to my future self. I'd show me your friends, I'll show you your future. He used to say, Dave, surround yourself by the right people and the right ideas. These are all daily things that I learned from you. But what I really learned, because we went through the same, different problems at the same time. When you illuminated your problem, and I saw so many people, I resonated with them and, and you, you endeared them, I have more people when I speak around the world come up to me and say, I just want to tell you that that really meant a lot to me because I'm having financial difficulties. And, I, it, it, and they identify with it and they accept it and then they move on instead of living in blame, shame, and justification. So here's the thing. As I used to tell you, the most important skill in life is listening. It's drawing out another human being. It's peeling back the layers of the onion little by little so that you can bond at a deep level, know someone else's greatest anxieties and fears and their greatest hopes and dreams. So if you can see the world the way another person sees it through their head and through their heart, you can navigate yourself gracefully through life. You can recruit, you can negotiate, you can problem solve, you can do all of those things. And especially as males, we tend to not share feelings so easily. Um, so a guy's walking down the street, he uh, has terminal cancer, someone else walks up to him, how you doing? Oh, great. Right. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> So to the extent that, that you shared your problems or I shared the struggles I've had, um, instead of all us wearing masks with each other in which you think that everyone else in the world has everything solved, it's only me that's defective. Right. <laughs> you finally reach out to the humanity in another person and then you, know, you can heal and have real conversations. And what to you, you know, I, I know where my, my bottom was or when, you know, my wife basically came to me and said, you know, hey, I'm not happy. You're pretty much a moron, Dave. And unless you go back and live by the values of the guy that I met, you know, I'm going to take these three beautiful girls and myself and find somewhere else to live. That, that was a big part for me. Was there a moment for you that you kind of went through an awakening with your struggles and said, you know what, I'm going to live because I'm so proud of you. Like I watch you, I cheer, you're not there, but every time I see you on TV, mm -hmm. 
you have such a following. People actually, vicariously, they text me and call me, oh my God, Lee Steinberg's <laughs> on 60 Minutes. Lee Steinberg's here. For me, I'm so excited. Well, what turned it for you? Um, proportionality. So it finally came to the point where I was struggling with alcohol. And I stepped back and said, I'm not a struggling peasant in Darfur fighting to have enough nutrition to live during the day. I don't have the last name Steinberg in Nazi Germany. And I don't have cancer. I, I, I don't have an affliction. But I do have three kids who depend on me. What excuse do I have for not doing that? And I do have the ability to, to design programs against bullying, to design a sporting green alliance to help the environment. I do have the ability to speak and write and communicate in a way that can bring relief to others. What excuse do I have? And uh, so my dad used to say to me, when you're looking for change in the world and you keep waiting for the amorphous they to do it, whether it's picking something up or tackling a problem, you keep waiting for they to do it. You know, the polit uh, politicians, older people, somebody else. He'd look at me and say, um, you could wait forever for someone else to do what's right. He'd say, you are the they, son. The they is you. So it's a sense of individual responsibility oh, yeah. that you have the capacity to have a vision and execute it, that you don't have to sit passively by and watch injustice or watch uh, uh, tragedy happen without taking the responsibility yourself to do something about it. Now, and, I, and I know you're also a voracious reader and you have an extraordinary memory. It drove me crazy, Lee. I, I, I have to tell you, I don't remember, but I, I worked really, really hard with you and for you, and you would come in, and I would have sometimes 16, 20 hour days, and you'd hand me, you know, Th Thomas Friedman's you know, flat <laughs> gold, and, and, and like literally the next morning, you're like, how was that book? Uh, did you read about the green coat on page 286? And you know, my brother has a memory like yours. He reads a lot, you know, went to Harvard, summa cum laude, he's almost as intelligent as you. But what, t tell the audience maybe, you know, what are the three must-read books in your life? And you've read thousands. Lately, I read uh, a, a, a book called Sapiens, which traces the human species, um, and it explains who we actually are, what our inborn instincts are, and traces how life actually evolved. And it's got a companion which is called uh, Deus, Homo Deus. I'm sure I've screwed up that <laughs> <laughs> Latin, I never took it. Um, which projects out into an age of artificial intelligence, an age of machine, an age of biomed. So those are profound books. Thomas Friedman came back and he wrote, uh, uh, thank you for being late. And that again is a projection into the future. If you want to know what's going on in politics in this country, there's a book. I don't. I don't. <laughs> I, 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 too much of that at home. And on TV. I got you. <laughs> it makes me sick. <laughs> Just read Dark Money by Jane Mayer, uh, which explains totally why we have no um, uh, very limited say in what actually goes on in the country. It's, it's interesting because, you know, my mom, who raised all her kids to be educated, you know, that was her vision is, I don't care what you do, you know, the fetus wasn't fully developed till after graduate school. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, but, but the one thing she said, and, and I think of you, is, you know, she always said, you, you need to read and you need to learn history because you learned human nature. And everything that you say about those books, they all project in the future, but they're based off of human nature and how human nature with the ego and the id and how we're in our own way so many times. You know, when were you most in your own way? Um, I was most in my own way when a series of external things happened. My father died. Uh, we discovered mold in a couple homes. We had um, uh, my marriage broke up, 
And instead of uh, working through those issues, I felt like Pavlov's dog, um, who rolled over before the doctor shocked him because he'd been shocked so many times, <laughs> or Gulliver on the beach, uh, tethered down by Lilliputians with them sticking little forks in me. I'd always been fine if I could, through hard work, effort, creativity, be able to, to solve something. Um, or at least give it a, a, a chance. But then I felt um, uh, trapped in that uh, situation. When people ask me, Dave, what the most uh, important study is to be a sports agent, a sports professional, sure. I always tell them psychology. I believe that. Because if you can understand what motivates people in the world, why they act the way they do, predict some behavior and understand, again, their, their heart and mind, then you've got the ability to, to, uh, to work out positive solutions in the world and, and to create a win-win you know, paradigm of cooperation. Now, what, one of my favorite funniest stories between us is that uh, at your 60, I won't mention, your birthday party, because <laughs> you look so young, but your birthday party, I got to meet your mom. And one of the first things I said is I said, you know, I had this baby boy at the time. I said, you know, you, your son's the, re he's the reason I had my son. He, he's the cause. And she looked at me like, what do you mean? <laughs> and, you know, you had been out in Hawaii with me, woke me up in the middle of the night. I couldn't go back to sleep. And there was baby oops right there. <laughs> and so Julie, my wife, always tells people, oh yeah, Lee, Lee's responsible for our kid. And people take it the wrong way. Or the other thing I say, they take the wrong way. So like every time I take a pee at AEG facilities, I think at least, because it says you save 42,000 gallons of water, right? for this waterless <laughs> urinal. And so it's so great for me, you know, I get to think of you all the time in such appropriate ways. We'll kind of end with a, a couple, couple quick questions. Number one, you, you know, people want to know it, but you do understand technology and social media. You're a great uh, follower. What's your favorite app that you use? I'm embarrassed to say I have no apps. Oh, really? I'm appless. He's out. That's, that's the favorite I'm, app. I'm app. appless. Can somebody please send me an app? <laughs> I'll send um, you some more interns. I'll you use all the apps. That's what I do. Um, Dave, the population of Orange County is not as large as the number of interns you have at your office. <laughs> uh, that's very true, but he taught me so well. That's mm -hmm. where we got that from. That's and then it. finally, I'm going to leave with an easy question for you. What legacy does Lee Steinberg want to leave? The first legacy is being a good parent, um, which I think is probably our most important contribution in the world. Um, and then it's the sense that one person can change the world, that we have the capacity and the duty to try to leave this world better than, than we found it. And people can do that in their own way, in their own uh, time. In other words, you do that by preaching a philosophy that makes people feel more empowered. Um, so can be any way, but, um, you know, he tried to do good. So you hear it, heard it here, I used to hear it every day. This Lee Steinberg on the playbook, be kind to your future self, think of others and put others first, empower others to empower others to be happy. I'm just thrilled to be here, Lee, and thank you for not only sharing this time, but most importantly, setting such a good example, not only for everyone, but specifically for me. Warren and I still consider you a great family friend uh, and a mentor, so thank you. Well, you've gone on to do great things. I'm proud of both you and Warren. Thank you, sir. If I can handle success and adversity really well, and I anticipate that they're coming, then it just becomes a series of highs and lows throughout your career, and you, I look back on it, and I can genuinely say I totally enjoyed the whole process.